today's episode, joined by Ian Beaver and Scott Lindsay, um, both uh, working with Varen Systems. Brilliant insights into AI. Um, these guys have been doing this for a couple of decades, they won't mind me saying, so this is not um, topical type stuff, but brilliant insights into from Ian how large language models work, transformer model. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely listen. The where we're going in six weeks, six months, and six years. Um, insights from Scott around some of the commercial considerations that the cloud vendors have to or will need to start to focus on the ethical and legislative uh, issues around AI come to the fore. Um, definitely, definitely one of the, the best lessons that I've had. I've got educated it now pretend to know a little bit about AI, but certainly I got an education into some of the insights in this episode. So thanks very much to Scott and Ian for their time today. You will really enjoy this lesson. Scott Lindsay, Ian Beaver, good morning, good afternoon, or good morning still for both of you guys this afternoon for me. Welcome to the Sunday podcast. Great to have you. This is the first time I've actually kicked off with a a duet, so to speak. Normally, these are one to one, but I'm kind of interested in, in where this conversation takes us. So, both you guys have been in the industry and in the AI industry, and specifically for quite a few years. So I think Ian, looking through some of your background, you have 2005. I read somewhere that you've been involved in systems like this, um, and you have quite a few patents to your name as well. So, um, I think it's going to be a great conversation just to given the current hype of where we are in large language models, conversational AI, maybe it's not hype, maybe it's reality, but we'll that delve into that a little bit. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, I guess before we kick in, um, perhaps maybe Scott, start with you, just because you happen to be top left of my screen, give it a little bit of background into yourself, um, and then Ian, you can, you can jump in as well. So uh, Oliver, thank you for, for, for having us. We look forward to the conversation. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm 25 years a product person. So a person that kind of takes concepts on through to product and, and, and to market. And over the course of those 25 years, my background is finance and accounting and CPA. I started my career um, in the finance area, developing accounting software and financial and analytic software, performance ma management software. Um, on the research side at that time as well, the statistical re research side. And then about 13 years or so ago, I moved into the customer and analytics da data side uh, and have been involved in research and complex statistical algorithms and all of those things that kind of evolved into what machine learning and AI is, is today over the, over the span of, of that time always with the lens of bringing the research to specific product use cases and then those uh, specific product use cases to market. Perfect. Um, Ian, do you want to give us a synopsis of your background as well? Sure. Yeah. So I've been working in um, research departments uh, for software companies for the last 17 years, um, mostly focused in in conversational AI. That's, that's where most of my background, and including... Uh, my PhD we're done in. Um, so currently I run the, the global research group for Verant. Uh, we're a group of PhDs and PhD students that are solving problems that are mostly independent of a specific product or business unit. And, and what we're really doing is delivering models as services uh, into the cloud platform that uh, allows products and, and partners to pick those things up and, and use them to add value uh, to whatever they're doing. Um, Although we're not really trying to compete with sort of like the general AI marketplace, uh, just sort of building generic sort of models, uh, we're really focusing on driving automation and value in, in, in contact centers, specifically in customer service use cases. So a lot of what we're doing is, is taking these more generalist type models and then adapting them to uh, specific use cases where we see there's there's a large value in automation. So. What has and Ian, maybe nothing, but you can, you can take me on this journey. What has changed in the last six, 12 months, apart from a very good marketing um, spin by, let's say, Microsoft or OpenAI, Open AI, but what has changed or have things changed or are things changing? I mean, you, obviously, you, you have been doing research at PhDs in this area. So 
And um, I suppose give me a view on that. And also, I guess, when we get into it, maybe in layman's terms, we all use these terminologies like generative AI, LLM, GPT. You know, let's start to, I guess, unpack that and explain, if you don't mind. Sure. So what's changed the last 12 months? Well, um, there's definitely been a culture shift. In the technology side, it's it's been, um, I'd say, a, a continuous gradual progression of finding things that are working better. A lot of it's been driven by um, just availability of hardware and, and um, improvements in toolkits and things that allow for training these, these massive models at scale uh, that, that have unlocked a lot of potential. Um, but the underlying technology really hasn't changed too much in the last 12 months. Um, you know, these are still... For the most part, these these large language models you hear of are, are still mostly based on on transformer architectures that are three or four years old at this point. But um, but really, what's what's changing is that culture has sort of understood capabilities that they can unlock and have started finding realistic use cases to plug them into, and and has been the uptake has been just drastically accelerated. And partly because the availability has been made easier through cloud platform providers. So you've got uh, not just Microsoft and OpenAI, but but now, you know, Amazon just recently released, um, you know, their, their bedrock service and their Titan models. And then you've got Google and they recently released their model gardens in, in Vertex AI with with Palm and, and some of these other large models now. And so you, you're seeing what's happening is this commoditization of these large models that puts them in reach of, of a lot of smaller companies that wouldn't otherwise have the resources to, to run these things. And so uh, just being available in these cloud services, uh, there's a bunch of other secondary ones too out there um, that aren't so much cloud platform providers, but they're providing APIs to these, these models that they've trained uh, think of like AI21 Labs or Cohere or things like that. Um, so just the sheer availability of these things has really exploded in the last year. Uh, and, and that's been driving a lot of these, these use cases and, and these changes that we're seeing. Um, that's, you know, I, I think in the research side of things, a lot of the focus has been more on making these things more efficient. Um, there's a lot of not only the supply chain issues, um, but but just the, the sheer compute necessary to run these large models at scale with the, the amount of demand that there is for just globally, everybody wants to use them to do things, um, is really driving a, a focus on making these models uh, smaller and more efficient without losing uh, the effectiveness. And so... Um, most of the the sort of the most recent models coming out now are not necessarily bigger than uh, a lot of the largest models. They're they're typically much smaller, but they're performing just as well or even beating them on on leaderboards. And so there's there's just in the in the research community, there's a lot of focus on how do we make more efficient models. Uh, yeah. and that's a really good thing because uh, they're, they're quite um, difficult to to host these things. Uh, just because of the the sheer compute necessary to run them fast enough to be applied to things like real time use cases, um, getting getting a large model to respond in in you know a second or less to a large block of text is is quite an engineering challenge. So um, that's where a lot of the focus is going right now. And and we will sorry go ahead Scott. Yeah, I would just add to that I, that the focus on the access, I think, is is key there, right? Prior to these models and Microsoft doing what they're doing with OpenAI, uh, these have been really restricted to research labs and in specialty cases and small groups of researchers within co co companies. It still may be hundreds or thousands of people, but not the general public, right? And I think that getting access to these things and Microsoft making it available so you could go ping an AI directly is way, is raising awareness across the board in the general pop population. We know as software vendors and researchers that AI has been used 
for a decade plus now, if not a little longer even, uh, or at least those underlying te techniques, uh, but behind the scenes. And what this is doing is the this access to the broad po population is allowing the everyday business user inside of organizations to start to engage with, with these tools. And I think a lot of organizations are dealing with acceptable use policies and trying to define those. Um, at the same time, they're trying to tap into the potential of how these could be used in the, in, in the use cases that, that, that Ian uh, speaks to as well. So I think that's been the, the fundamental shift is now they're the broad population is more is very broadly aware that AI is being used, and they're starting to ask those questions: What is it doing? Why is it doing it? How is it doing it? And I think as this conversation evolves, and as the technology evolves, we're all going to be working towards answering th those questions as as we go forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's that's certainly mass market awareness of it is is helping. Let's. Maybe it's helping and hindering, but helping in the sense I recall going back 15, 20 years building IVR systems, interactive voice response, and um, you almost were embarrassed to say what you did at one time <laughs> because of how poor the systems were. were. And um, no, they they did evolve. But I what I see now in the last 12 months, so if you say that, you know, the classical, does your granny know what you do type question, um, we work in conversational AI, almost your granny and anyone from five years of age actually knows what that is. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely engaging, but I think perhaps I'll take your view on this, that hype can also drive it in a direction maybe that's not good either. Cause, um, and again, maybe Ian, you can drill down into this in terms of like what a transformer model is, but you know, it's not the answer to all things. Um, which I think some people, and I, I think that's one of the fears that, you know, we would have in the industry now is getting like, well, AI is going to do everything for us, you know, but um, so do you want to take, a, I suppose, give us a maybe five, 10,000 feet view in on terms of uh, general between transformers, what they are and, you know, how they, I guess if we do it maybe in layman's terms or lay woman's terms from the outset, that's possible. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess, at, at, at a high level, um, it is important to generally know how they work because people will build unrealistic expectations of their behavior. And um, so without going through all the history, because it really is has been uh, very much an evolution over, over the last several decades of, of people building on prior people's work and, and making tweaks and adding changes. And then there's been a couple of sort of breakthroughs on the hardware side and things, but the transformer model really um, was a paradigm shift because it allowed training these models in parallel, which before that, uh, these neural networks had to be trained sort of layer by layer and it, it didn't allow for that. Uh, so, so that really unlocked the door to, to training these sort of massive models. Uh, but, but how a transformer works at a, at a very sort of general level is there's I'd say three kind of main components. Um, the first is that people have to realize that computers don't operate on text. They, they operate on numbers. Um, you know, the, the actual processing is all done in, in numerical form. And, and so the first thing you have to do is figure out how you're gonna convert human language into numbers. And, and this is done in, in neural networks uh, through what's called uh, an embedding layer. And, and what this does is it basically creates a, um, a, a numerical representation of words. And, and this, is, this is really very critical because how you choose to represent words is gonna have an impact on what that model's sort of understanding of, of human language space is. And so um, this embedding layer, what it does is it will create a, sort of like a coordinate for uh, a given word or, or what's called a token, which is really a, a portion of, uh, of uh, you know, longer words get broken up. But, but the idea is that if you look at a map, like, like a globe or a map, uh, you can represent any location or, or a town uh, through a 2D coordinate space, right? So you have latitude and longitude. And if you give someone a latitude and longitude, that represents a, a place, right? A, a, a town. And so, 
So you could consider that latitude and longitude of a town to be the 2D or two-dimensional embedding of that town in the map space. And this is really what happens when you take language and you go to numbers is, is you're creating a, a numerical representation that really represents a point in space uh, with locality to other points in space, which are where other words end up in this, in this space. And so you can relate one town to another by its latitude and longitude coordinates the same way a model is able to uh, basically say this word is nearby or it's far away from this other word based on the distance between these things and these coordinate spaces. And so as you train these models, what happens is as it sees just tons and tons and tons of examples of a given language, um, it starts pushing words that show up in similar contexts close to each other, and it starts pushing words that are used very differently far away from each other. And so uh, these models then begin to reason about word usages based on where they show up uh, nearby or far away from uh, other words and, and how they're used. And so uh, this is what lets these large models basically take um, any kind of, of, of Phrasing. So you can say the same thing many different ways using different words, and the model can actually equate them as being semantically similar is because it can look in this embedding space and see these words are very similar to each other because they're very nearby each other. And so that, that embedding space is very critical uh, because that's what really sets up the ability for the model to reason over uh, similarity or differences between, between words and their usages and context. And so Basically, the larger the space you embed these words in, the more information that space can carry as far as the context that these words are used in. Um, so that's the embedding space. And then the next piece is the encoder layers. And really what this does is it takes uh, these words, and these, these representations of these words, and it's going to perform a bunch of transformations on this where it uses a mechanism called attention. But, but the idea is that when you have references in words or reference words like it and they and, and, and things like that, it has to look up or essentially um, dereference that to say, what are we talking about when you say it? And this attention layer helps it do that, but it also helps it focus on the the uh, the text that is most important at this at this stage in its processing, basically, as it's going through the word stream, uh, it's saying, okay. At this point, what I really need to pay attention to are these things. And when they said it here, this references back to this dog, you know, we talked about earlier, whatever it is. And so this, this, um, this embedding layer allows the model to do that sort of dereferencing and also to, to attend to the things that are most important that are going on. And, and these encoder layers are typically stacked on each other. So you have a bunch of them. And, and when you're done going through the encoding layers, what you have is essentially this, um, this sort of meaning of, of the, the text that has been shown. It's a numerical representation of meaning in a sense. And, and the deeper the layers and the, and the larger the layers, the more of that you can kind of encode. Um, but what happens is if you have text that has similar meaning to some other text, even though you use completely different words and things, they should show up at the end of the encoding layer as, as being similar to each other, much like in the embedding layer, words that were used similarly will show up near each other. And this allows uh, models to sort of condense or distill the, um, the meaning of text, the semantics into uh, uh, some internal representation. And this is where it gets really hard to understand how these types of models work is because what they're doing is essentially a compression task, but it's, it's generating these sort of internal representations that only the model understands and a human would never understand, you know, what, what this, this sort of, uh, this sort of embedding and uh, encoding really is, it means to anybody outside of the model, right? And even between models, they'll come up with very different representations. And the last layer takes that, that sort of meaning layer out of the encoders and it decodes it into the output. And really what this is doing is, is trying to get the model to respond appropriately to whatever was said. And what happens here at the final layer, and this is the part where, you know, really it, it's, it's important to understand is 
uh, a model has a certain vocabulary that it's been exposed to, and that's the only thing it can output are, are words that it's seen before. And what ends up happening in sort of the last sort of layer of this whole decoding process is it maps um, it maps this this output vector onto its its vocabulary, and it says which word is the highest probability of being the, the best word to, to generate next. And it does this process over and over again for each word. And so every word it's saying, okay, here's what I've said so far, uh, and here's the next best highest probability word. And it just keeps doing that. Um, and so these generative models are basically just solving this, this probability. They're just outputting this probability distribution over the words that it knows. And you can, with the parameters, you can you can sort of tweak a little bit to give it like what we would consider creativity. But the idea is that when a word comes out, it's just the highest probability based on all of this embedding, encoding, decoding layers have determined. It's it's not reasoning in the sense yeah. of logical, um, you know, mathematical type uh, symbolic processing where you have a set of rules and it's guaranteed it will always follow those rules every time. It's, it's all probabilities. And, um, this is where, you know, these things tend to what we call hallucinate or make up facts is because, yeah. um, it's really the probability distribution says that this is the next best word, even though that word has nothing to do with the context maybe, or it was, um, you know, something like if you're asking it to summarize an article, Maybe that wasn't even in the article, but for whatever reason, based on its training and the way that it encoded and decoded it, it said this is the most likely word. And, and so these things aren't thinking in the terms that we as humans think. Um, they're really just doing this uh, tons of linear algebra and generating this probability distribution and, and working on that. So yeah. Maybe that's too low a view, but <laughs> no, it's um, it, it's uh, it's definitely at a level, and and I know from your own research, you could probably go down <laughs> ten levels more in terms of the the depth. Um, Scott, do you want you want to come in there in terms of your perspective on it? No, well, I think that you know, as it determines each word as it gets processed, of what the next the probable probability of what the next word is, right? It, there's variation there. Which is why, you know, if you go to these engines and you ask it, give me the top three and pick a historical figure, the top three reasons why such and such or who such and such is, it gives you three different answers. Three, di if you ask it, three, di three, th three different questions. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that kind of leads in, you know, understanding the approach that it's building the answer as it's going and cycling through and building a sentence, much like a writer does. And sometimes it goes back and it changes out words and uses other words and the, all of that, all, all of that's happening kind of behind the scenes and in, in internal machine speak. Uh, but at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily determine the same probabilities each and every time. So if you ask it the, the, the same questions, you're going to get di di different answers. Um, and I think that's one of the things, one of the the things that we're that we have to deal with, you know, in deploying these 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 types of solutions. Yeah, and, and someone who we read recently, um, their explanation of hallucinations was like a political speech in the sense that uh, it all sounds very plausible. You see the audience nodding and agreeing. Uh, whenever you deconstruct the speech, you realize there's very little substance or truth in it. So. <laughs> I'm not. I don't think it's actually quite accurate, but uh, yeah, that's a very good analogy. It actually, um, because of the corpus of data that's trained upon, um, it certainly comes across as very plausible, um, but not necessarily always absolutely accurate. Yeah, and, and the larger the model is, so I mean, what controls that is, is the more layers that you have in your encoder and decoder, and the larger the embedding vector size and all that stuff, and the more vocabulary a certain model has, that's going to basically create a larger resulting model. And when you hear things like, well, this is a 12 billion parameter model versus a 40 billion or 176 billion or 640 billion, really what that means is, is that's, that's the, the larger the model, the more of those layers it has, which means it, it has a larger effective memory uh, in their trained parameters. And, it, and it, it allows those bigger models to make better abstractions and better predictions of the appropriate output words. So the larger models sound more plausible because they're much 
they're much uh, more refined at being able to generate language. Uh, but that doesn't mean that a larger model is any more accurate um, you know, than, a, than a smaller model. Uh, they just sound better. And, and size isn't everything, you know, with model performance, but it is a big factor because it allows the model, like I said, to build a sort of a larger memory space of everything it's been trained on. And obviously these, well, maybe not obviously, these large, large language models are giving a good bedrock, I guess, for organizations to start to use these concepts. So, um, but obviously by definition, they're trained on generic data. So how do you, and I know it's an area you look at specifically, Scott, as well, around the whole product management of Vinci, for example, how do you see organizations and, you know, whatever, be it financial services, retail, taking advantage of these, but are also learning on top data that's pertinent and relevant to them and their customers? Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think, you know, I think with with LLMs, I mean, there's definitely a tool there that can do a lot of things, right? And I think we start with asking the question, should it? You know, what should it do? <laughs> uh, should yeah. it do this task? Can it do this task? How reliable are the answers when it does, do, do, does this task? What's the risk profile uh, to a right answer, to a wrong answer, uh, to it learning in the right direction, to it learning in the wrong d direction as it as it kind of goes goes forward. Um, so so we do some some of those assessments right right up front, uh, and then as we look to the de to deploy these, we try to define the tasks down to a very specific job where we know it's going to either automate a task or a process or perform an analytic. And then if we can isolate those things um, uh, to, uh, to very narrow confines, so we're not asking it to do a lot of things, then we can better evaluate the output it provides uh, to make sure that the quality level is there, uh, that it fits the context, uh, and it actually accomplishes the job that it needs to accomplish. And I think we do we look at the tools and we look at the underlying lar large language models. Um, we fit it to the task. We fit it to the economic um, uh, fit of the customer. I mean, we can you can throw processing power uh, at everything, and if you have an unlimited budget, but in reality, a lot of these cases, uh, budget and uh, and what people want to pay for these things really matters. Uh, so we have to fit it into certain cook compute power uh, constraints, and then there's quality uh, c constraints as well. So we use eval evaluations across all three of the, those components as we define, you know, which language model we're going to use, what, what task it, it, it performs, and how well does it perform that, that task. Uh, and in a lot of cases, Ian and, and his research teams across Variant uh, are, the, are, are the folks that are making those, those determinations for us. And, and I mean, what I know the investment stage, when I asked, like the investment to data, Microsoft, for example, or OpenAI have put into this has been significant from what I've heard, billions, if not tens of billions, plus a huge amount of human input. Do you think, is that an ongoing requirement or do you feel we're at the sort of stage where a lot of that base level heavy lifting's done and then it's learning, again, because this is important to organizations who want to utilize and deploy these, um, technologies and large language models if the ongoing investment from training the model is you know is significant then their adoption is really going to be impacted mm -hmm. i think I'll, I'll i'll kind of talk from a market perspective first and then uh and then ian can talk about it from a technology component there but um it is significant and i think it will continue and needs to continue um uh, maybe it'll level off at some at, at some point, but I'm not quite sure when. Um, you know, all of the companies, whether if it's my, my Microsoft, Google, Meta, whatever um, out there, a Amazon, they're they're all investing at the at these levels and need to in order to to get these models out there. At some point, it's going to become a commodity, but but until then. You know, right now, being a key partner with them as cloud as cloud providers as well, we know that they're trying to find ways 
to get vendors like Verant to solve problems for customers that are willing to pay for, 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 for those things to recover a lot, a lot of those costs. And I think, I think, We've seen in the market with the launch of of OpenAI and G, GPT and Chat GPT, kind of this general public knowledge. But now companies are really gra grabbing a hold of those tools. They're testing those those use cases uh, that that we talked through a few moments ago, and looking to commercialize those. And these big vendors that are doing these the, these investments. Um, and whether it be through a not-for-profit like, like, like OpenAI or through Hugging Face or, or others out there, um, uh, the, the investment is there and they're looking to, to, to recoup those, those costs as, as quickly as possible because this is going to be a long-term investment uh, and you know, there's no early winner in this uh, and you know, cloud uh, neutral uh, solutions li like variant solutions um, need to hedge their bets and uh, and use all almost in a best of breed evaluation um, for each project for each task that we choose to to automate. Ian, do, do you want to come in there with a view on that? Are they, I suppose, the level of investment to date and the ongoing investment. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think as long as these large cloud vendors uh, and corporations feel they can capture market share and, and lock in people to their platforms and solutions, they're going to continue to, to throw lots of investment in this. Um, there is there is definitely a lot of um, competition going on between them to, to get people onto their platform and keep them there through the exclusivity of the models they have trained and their capabilities. So if you have the best model, people are in a sense have to migrate to your platform to use it. Um, and, and so uh, I think right now that's what's driving a lot of this this big investment is is really uh, using the models almost like a fishing lure to get people onto your platform and keeping them there. And um, and there is uh, there's other investment too, but but I think that will level off at a certain point as these models sort of reach uh, a level of of utility that any improvement is very you know minor incremental type. Um, we're, we're already kind of reaching you know with GPT four and things we're we're reaching models now that that I mean GPT four already passed a bar exam right, so it could be your lawyer yeah, in a sense. Yeah. But, um, you know, they're getting to the point where they are quite functional. Uh, they still have their flaws and they still have their, uh, you know, the concerns with, with the, um, you know, making, making up facts and things. But for the most part, uh, you can find very good business use cases for the models that are out there today. And I think at a certain point, the investment's going to have to level off just so that companies can get caught up with how much they've poured into to the investment of these things and, and get that paid back off. But um, there will always be sort of a competition on who's got the best model if, if, if that will drive uh, adoption and people, you know, changing from, say, one vendor to another. It, Every company that's out there that's saying, well, we use chat GPT for X automatically means they're on Azure, right? You don't have any other mm. choice but to run on Azure. So uh, there's there's challenges to that too, because uh, you know, there's there's availability issues with with regions and things. Um, like we're a global company and we have uh, cl clients and customers across the world, and there are certain regions of the world where you cannot ship your data out of that and, and ship it over to say Germany or uh, the US where a chat GPT model is available. So we have to go with uh, another option that that maybe does have availability in say Brazil or somewhere like that. So, um, you know, there's, there's business decisions too on top of these technology decisions that um, are really driving adoption. And it's, it's forcing these cloud vendors to invest heavily in outfitting data centers, you know, in regions around the world where they can, they can then run these things. And that's just making NVIDIA stock go through the roof. So um, yeah. it's the other thing too, is, is all of everybody is, is sort of reliant on this, um, this hardware um, supply chain and, and it's, 
it's very hard to get large numbers of these devices if you're trying to build this out in your own personal data centers. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's very hard to get compute capacity from these cloud vendors. Uh, we've experienced this where it doesn't matter any, any of them. Uh, it, is, it is extremely hard to get free capacity on some of the largest GPU um, instances available. Uh, because everybody is experimenting with and trying to run workloads on these large language models that are consuming all of the, the larger instance types with multiple GPU cards. And so uh, there is just this, this sense of global demand uh, that is just driving the hardware industry. You know, NVIDIA's got what, one or almost a two-year backlog on their orders yeah. now for their devices. And it's just, uh, it's insane. Um so, so the demand is 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 really having an effect on the hardware industry and the data center industry, and uh, you know all these cloud vendors are pouring tons of resources, not even in just in the model development, but in the infrastructure necessary to do the model development. And so, um, there is uh, there's a lot of been a lot of engineering sort of uh, breakthroughs and. Um, advancements just in how you do sort of distributed cross data center training of these models and, and hosting of these models, just due to the sheer demand of people wanting to use them. Uh, and it's an interesting point. Um, I was going through my head as you were chatting the, the Tesla model. Um, and I'll explain what I'm uh, talking about. So uh, Tesla have over the last number of years tried to own the production chain end to end because of limitations around you know, battery production, et cetera. Do, do you think any of these large vendors, and I'm talking Google, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, will, will start to do maybe more in the hardware space because of restrictions, limitations, to try and own that, you know, really end-to-end? -end? Yeah, and, th and they already have. So Amazon already has their own, you know, tensor processing units that they've designed in-house. And then, uh, you know, Microsoft's been working on theirs. I've heard for Azure and Google for a long time has been, building its own, you know, data centers and, and uh, tensor processing units uh, just to keep their costs down, uh, but also so that they can have a market on the, on, the, uh, on the supply chain, but they're also optimizing these, these chips for their use cases and things, which gives them a bit of an edge in, in not just uh, raw compute power, but also efficiency. I mean, just the costs of running these large data centers from a, from a, a you know, electricity and a cooling perspective is massive. So, in, you know, a 5% improvement in efficiency is huge cost savings for these companies. So there's, there's big incentive for them to get involved. And I guess sticking with what I was going to call it, is it an arms race that, that we're kind of in? Is it, um, Somebody said it was a two-horse race, maybe three or four months ago. Google, Microsoft, um, Meta have thrown something into it, and we've now got open source. So, what's the thoughts here? Are we in an arms race? Is it a two-horse race, or is it going to just splinter? Uh, there's more. There's definitely more than two horses. I, I think what's happening now is from all three cloud vendors. Um, we're seeing more of a marketplace approach where it's not exclusively what they have built. Now what they're trying to do is take in uh, models from these other vendors, which are more kind of, I call them boutique, uh, you know, model trainers. They're, they're working on models that are very good at sort of specific tasks, uh, like the AI21 Labs and the Coheres and, and uh, um, these types of companies. Um, and they are offering their models on their platforms with, with some type of exclusivity sort of agreement things. And um, so this is this is very much the approach that Amazon has has gone down the road of. They've recently released this, this product called Jumpstart, which lets you uh, quickly sort of launch models from lots of different vendors uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment. Um, and then... Google as well has been bringing in models from outside companies and making them available in their Vertex platform. And, and so um, I think there, there is definitely more companies involved, but they might be getting delivered on sort of the top three platforms. 
Um, you know, Meta has been basically releasing its models for research like Llama and OPT and things like that um, because they're not a cloud vendor in so much as, you know, selling directly mm -hmm. to uh, cloud service providers. Um, so they don't have quite as much incentive to really lock down sort of model availability as, as the, the cloud vendors do. But there's definitely, um, there's definitely more than, than two horses in the race. And I think the other thing that we're seeing, uh, like I said, really from the open source side is driving it, is the, the efficiency of these models. Because the open source communities and the research going on in universities, they don't have sort of this infinite access to, to uh, compute. And, uh, and they don't have necessarily as large of data centers and things. So, so there is a much more focus on building these more efficient models. And, and we're seeing a lot more of those coming out from, from open source and, and um, uh, research places like Stanford and so on. They're, they're building these models and releasing them in the community um, so that you can run them anywhere that, that you want. Uh, and that's right now, if you went to the leaderboard on say hugging face, I mean, these, these, there's, these models are outperforming many of the, the top largest models from commercials because, uh, commercial industry, because they are, uh, have really focused on making them efficient. I think deployability becomes the economics of and deployability becomes the biggest component of that. Um, as we say, these large vendors are rolling out these capabilities around the globe in every region. A lot of client restrictions about data not not leaving particular regions or particular uh, countries start start to limit what's possible and not not possible. I think that that forces you know cloud neutral so solutions. Uh, to have multiple solutions on how a single problem is solved, especially if it's the if it's a large la language model, which is very difficult to to duplicate and re replicate in multiple regions of the, of the world to, to to solve the problems. Um, so the economics of it uh, really bear a large impact into the adoption, and I think that's why you're seeing in in Hugging Face um, a large a large group of these smaller models that are more highly de deployable or, or easily de de deployable, um, not uh, you know get getting chosen to solve the tasks ra rather than so some of these larger, uh, huge models. And you know, from your perspective, Scott, then you know that product management side of stuff. So obviously, like Savine doing you know brilliant work in terms of the research. I guess what's top of your mind in terms of how do you take a lot of that and how does it manifest itself then in, in real world business aligned use cases and products? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, we really start with the use case itself and then uh, whether uh, how it builds in an automation or an analytic that was going to be very human intensive b b before. Uh, so that we really want to enhance uh, the human worker and augment them with additional automation tools around them. So that, um, you know, if they're on a agent call and they're talking to a customer and the call finishes, uh, we pick a use case where, okay, there's four or five tasks that a, that agent needs to do to wrap up the call. And we're building automation bots to help them wrap up the call. Um, that you know, if uh, if an interaction starts in an email uh, and then transfers to a contact center uh, to about an individual a cu customer, right? Then there's some background that that agent needs to understand about the email thread that that that, that took place prior. So the bot can summarize th those things and make the agent the agent aware of them pr pr pretty quickly as they begin to engage with the customer on uh, on the call. So it really starts with with those those automation and that and that underlying use case, um, and then from a from a a platform and how we deliver it. You know, we take a microprocess approach. Uh, we use standardized do Docker containers in a cloud neutral environment that we can re replicate to regions around the world, uh, and then we use various types of training models. 
you know, is this model going to be static and doesn't really need to be trained on the uh, on additional data? Do we need to layer additional training in in into this model that, that that's client specific, um, or is it a dynamic model where it's a one time use and the model kind of go, go goes away until the, the the next time it's called? So we put these mechanisms in place about the automation use case, how, how it's packaged and made available within a, within a region. Um, the, and then, and then uh, how that is going to be used by, by the client and de 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 deployed by, by the client in, in the front ends of the applications that, that, that themselves so that it augments humans, right? It doesn't make the decision for, for, for a human. It actually provides data or additional insight so that a human can then decide what the next steps are. I mean, that, that's, I guess, raises an interesting point and it's another piece of jargon we in the industry tend to use called human in the loop. Is, um, I mean, that's, uh, again, my view, and I'm, I'll, I'll ask you guys, is that kind of critical at the moment? Um, will that continue to be critical? Obviously, at, at a number of or at, at different levels, from the initial training of data and sanitization of that, but also then the ongoing engagement, perhaps if it's with a consumer or a customer, is I guess two questions. And do you see that that is necessary now, and will that continue to be necessary into the future? Yeah. Oh. So. One thing we haven't talked about too much yet is is really the AI regulation and, and the coming <laughs> the, the the coming regulations that are are they're inevitable but they're really getting hammered out now um, in the EU and, and in uh, the US and, and elsewhere and really what if you look at the drafts of of the requirements that that like the EU AI Act and things are going to put in place is um they're going to categorize applications of ai into sort of you know low to high risk sort of uh, applications and then these higher risk areas where you're talking about say maybe medical or uh anything that has to do with maybe a person obtaining or keeping a job or something like that um they're forcing that these these models must produce some explanations of their behavior and other predictions and uh, why, you know, they did the recommendation or whatever they did. And with current model architectures, like this, this transformer model I was talking about, it is very hard uh, to, to guarantee um, these, these types of explanations are, are realistic or, or truly what the model did. Because as I was saying, it, it's very difficult for humans to understand the, the inner representations of of language that these models sort of encode, and then and then why they decoded things the way that they did. Uh, so so that understanding that why is very hard. And there there are toolkits and things that try to sort of probe the model behavior to to, to try to um, uh, in a sense uh, make an estimation of why. But that may not be good enough depending on how the regulation ends up getting written. So what that's going to do is, is really force more of this sort of human in the loop supervision refining type uh, applications because um, in, in an variant, one of our AI philosophies is that that humans should really have the final say in anything that's that's critical. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, is save them time, as much time as we can, but we want to make sure that there's some checkpoint uh, in that process where there's a review and the model decision is not uh, really made without uh, human supervision. So if, for example, we're doing quality management or quality analysis of contact center agents and, and a, a grade is delivered for a particular agent in a particular area, you say maybe this person doesn't have a great communication skills compared to other people. Well, why not? Like we should be mm. able to tell them what features exist in this person's communication skills uh, or don't exist compared to the other people. And there should be some way that we can explain to a supervisor why this person got the grade that they got. And that should make sense with the data. Like the supervisor should be able to go back and verify those facts. And, and it shouldn't be just made up. Um, but because of this inability to sort of um, not only sort of force behavior, but also explain it, I think there'll be a lot more 
uh, interest in the field of what's called neurosymbolic uh, models, which are an attempt to combine logical rules over symbols, uh, which is sort of more traditional, classical, what you would call AI, uh, with the ability to learn automatically from data, which is really the power of machine learning and things. Uh, is regulation sort of forces stricter controls and guarantees on model behavior. I think there's going to be a lot more investment into uh, architectures and designs of models that can actually um, uh, basically uh, it'll be able to to meet these regulational requirements. So I think human in the loop, I mean, when we started talking about that years ago, it was about training data and how how you can go in and tweak the training data to get a desired output, right? And that it was a research scientist back there tweaking and tuning the the the, the data. I mean, human in the loop, I think, also apply, applies to decisions, right? Um, where where we want to make sure that you know a human has the ultimate say and is is basically using the information with. with you know that that some of the AI augments for for them um, going going forward. Uh, the training data component of human in the loop uh, is going to be more and more fully automated as a, as it goes, right? I think that I think that there are a lot of tools, a lot of evolution there. Uh, and even some of these large language models help that, right? It, you mm -hmm. can create and soft label data and you can start to train things. Um, but I think human in the loop on the data training side becomes something different. It isn't actually tweaking the data itself. It's, it's now monitoring and testing the results of the output and the monitoring of the engine itself and the quality of, uh, uh, of the output. That becomes the human in the loop co component, not the manufacturer of the data or the adjustments of the data itself. And I think that we're moving in the same direction with, with decisions, right? As long as we we have humans involved in, in the decisions, the decisions are, are monitored, we're gonna see these technologies develop trust layers where it starts to build a case as to why it recommends a certain thing. And then that is gonna build trust uh, to the people that that are using you know it to drive the decisions to go forward and on that explainable side of it you know the explainable AI you've mentioned Ian, uh human comprehension in terms of how it's uh understanding these language models is just not there so how, how do we get into that explainable is it a super AI that becomes the the guidance, the guidance, or the or the explainer of what's happening in these different models. Uh, there's there's several different approaches being actively sort of investigated in in the research community. One is to make the models inherently explainable themselves, like they they not only output whatever their prediction is or whatever text they generate, but they also output some sort of a of an explanation like uh you know they, they point to certain facts and you see this like even with say bing chat or uh, some of these chatbots they're building they're not only giving you the answer but they're giving you a link to the article where you can you can what is supposedly their source now a lot of times there's there's still inconsistencies there uh, but at least they can be caught so for example mm -hmm. it tell you some fact or, or answer your question and they say, and here's the source and you go click on it, read the source and you find out, well, what the model said wasn't entirely accurate, um, but but that's discoverable now. Uh, whereas before, if they just gave you the answer with no source, you, you would you would either have to take what it had to say, believe it or uh, or not and go do your own research. So, so getting models to generate sources is uh, one, one approach. Uh, another approach is just entirely different architectures. Like I mentioned, neural symbolic models is is a way where uh, you can actually, in a sense, uh, train more uh, of a logical rules based sort of approach model that would actually give you the output of each of those steps, and then you could see at which point did it make an error. Uh, if it did, uh, there's been um, several papers around getting uh, models like ChatGPT to to output um, a series of, of sort of reasoning that led to the answer that it gave. 
uh, and then you can kind of see the logic errors propagate and things like that. Uh, there's external tools too that, like I said, they they kind of probe the uh, sort of the input space. Like they make minor changes and they see what the model output does, and then they they basically can infer. Um, well, if you swap these two words, the output goes from correct to wrong, and therefore the sensitivity is in the word ordering or something like that. And so this is one of the tools that like the uh, Microsoft Responsible AI Toolbox does is it, it takes your model and it takes the training data and it looks for situations where maybe there's a bias in the model because with this subgroup, it's right 90% of the time, but if I cut the training data into this subgroup, then it's right only 20% of the time. Therefore, you know, there's a there's an inherent bias in the model towards this subgroup. And then once you know that, you can either try and train it out of the model or you can just drop the confidence if you're dealing with a subgroup and just don't trust the model, right? And so there's a bunch of different approaches. Um, I think ultimately the, the final solution will probably be some combination of them, but um, we'll see. It's, it's a big active field and, and there's a lot of work going on and certainly isn't solved yet. So we're at the tipping point of, of many things um, and not that that's only one of them. I'm, I'm conscious we're also uh, running quite close to our time and I don't want to use up you guys all day, which we probably could. Um, but I guess a, a couple of things maybe to try and wrap up some of the conversation I guess, first of all, what do you see as the, as the biggest impediment progress um, in this field overall? And I'm, I'm talking more of the generative AI as opposed to the general AI and uh, conversation AI. What, what do you see as the blockers in the next well, well, six weeks? And that the pace things are going at, it could be six weeks, um, six months or six years. Scott, I'll let you... Okay. Let it, I let Ian ponder his 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 answer here, and go. you can come in. <laughs> um, I think right now it's the economics uh, that are probably the biggest hin hindrance of this, because these large cloud vendors need somebody to pay them, and uh, and you know vendors in between are looking at their expert systems, uh, whether it be con contact center or financial or whatever it is. And looking at, at, at use cases, and now you know we're just running into logistical problems of can we deploy this on a global basis for a global customer that requires global solutions with data to be kept in region? Um, and you know we alluded to this a little bit earlier about we may we may need to use multiple different technologies in different regions to accomplish the same tasks. Um, just because it's just, you know, the vendors just don't have it deployed enough uh, across the globe uh, to make it available. Um, so I think the economics of that, the practical rollout of that is probably the challenge that most are going to face in the next six weeks to the next six, six months. Uh, and then I think beyond that, we're going to go into a world where we have AI producing these things. The general public is aware of these answers. And then I think that's going to be the scrutiny, just like a human making a decision. How, how, did, how did that human make, make a decision? How did this AI make, make that, that decision? Yeah. And, and did it comply with all of the regulatory environments that it needs to comply with? Ian, Ian do you want to you ponder your, your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the one of the big unknowns we talked about regulation and, and pending regulation, but there's also a lot of we're we're really entering a, a new world in terms of litigation too. And, and right now, there are several lawsuits that have been filed against OpenAI and Microsoft on things from defamation to uh, GDPR uh, violations and stuff like this, and how those lawsuits play out in court, which will probably take years, is going to have a huge impact on future applications and, and these model creations. Because if a court ruling comes in and says, well, you're not allowed to just scrape data off the internet and train a model on it, that's going to completely change the, the way that these large generative models are, are produced. And that will have set a precedent that, that makes the risk for the companies building these things much higher. So they're gonna be a much more 
uh, uh, they're going to become much more cautious on how these things are built and deployed. So the litigation world is is just getting started uh, in terms of generative AI and, and how these things, as the general public not only has gotten exposure, but they've started to see some of the harms that can come in. Uh, I mean, we've seen lots of lawsuits against Tesla as well for accidents involving self-driving cars. But, um, you know, as as people experience some of the damaging side of these things, uh, whether it's uh, these things spouting off something that's untrue about them as fact, or people using uh, the output of, say, a chatbot instead of um, going to a source like Wikipedia or something for information uh, and just trusting it fully, and now they're completely misled on the truth of something. Um, you know, the the more that these sorts of things happen, and the more these lawsuits get sort of hammered out in court and set precedences, it's going to really change uh, the field over the next you know months to years, yeah. and that's also going to drive regulation changes that will further enforce and entrench. Uh, some of the ways that these things can be built and deployed. So I think the legislation and regulation is is a big unknown right now. Um, I think we're starting to see some of that take shape. Uh, but right now people are, I do feel like in a sense, it is a bit of an arms race where people are just trying to build as, as big and powerful as things as fast as they can and get them out there to sort of win the market share yeah. with, without um, necessarily having any kind of a, uh, uh, a framework that they're required to work in and, and that requirement is coming and it's going to cause people to backtrack probably some and reevaluate what's been built. And if it's, if, if these GDPR um, requirements get enforced on them, they're going to have to start pulling some of these models off the shelf and retraining and how are you going to do that uh, in a, in a, in an efficient and cost-effective way. And there's, there's just a lot of things that still have to be hashed out. Uh, on, on that side. And then we've yeah. already talked about availability of hardware. That's right now a big limiting factor for a lot of people, availability of cloud uh, instances that allow you to do and work with these types of models. There's there's a lot of constraints because of the popularity. And I think as the supply chain catches up and already cloud vendors have been scaling out data centers as they begin to solve some of those capacity issues, um, that will help yeah. smaller companies get involved and start taking advantage of these systems. Uh, and you'll just see more adoption actually happening more quickly. Yeah, I, th I think for sure. Um, one thing, there are many imponderables, but one thing guaranteed, I guess, is the pace of change is not going to lessen any time soon over the next three, six, nine, 12 months, or even 12 years. So I think being in the, being in the industry, that's great for the likes of ourselves who are who are interested in this, but I think uh, I'm pretty sure we'll start to see uh, a lot of real value coming to both consumers and businesses and organizations that we all serve over the next number of weeks, months, and, and years on this. Um, guys, listen, it's it's gone over probably an hour. It's been fascinating um, conversation, and uh, definitely we will be back for episode two um, and a rerun not a rerun we'll, we'll probably look back at some of this and see how, how how many predictions have actually come through but I certainly would like to pick up with you guys again and in, in, in a few months time and just see where the industry's at and I really appreciate your time this morning so fantastic conversation uh, thank you very much guys thank you for having us yeah thanks a lot glad to be here